So welcome everyone. Happy Hanukkah. My name is Aliza Abrams Koenig and I'm the Director of Alumni Engagement for Yeshiva University. We are so excited and, and honored that you all joined us here tonight. We know that Hanukkah is a busy time and a festive time and we thought no better time than to bring our YU family together than on Hanukkah. And how fun to do it over a wine tasting at a time when we really can't get together all over the place. Instead, we're bringing the party here to your living room, kitchen, dining room, wherever you may be sitting. So we have tonight amazing, amazing representation from three wineries. And we're very excited for you each to learn from them and to hear from them and of course, to taste their wines. So as I mentioned, if you haven't yet gotten your bottles open, please do. We hope you chilled your white wine and decanted your red wines because it'll just enhance the experience that much more. Before I start, I just wanted to thank everyone um, who is for participating with us, of course, tonight, our moderator. We have a pinch hitter tonight, Jay Booksbaum is representing as our moderator. So thank you so much. We have Ronnie Jesselson, Michal Ackerman and Jacob Nair David. And I just wanna say a special thank you to Jacob and Michal who are actually right now speaking to us live from Israel where it's three o'clock in the morning. And that's how dedicated they are to the wine industry. And of course, to sharing their knowledge with us here at Yeshiva University. So we want to, of course, also welcome all of our alumni and all of our friends of our alumni who are with us tonight. So without more, without spending more time on the welcomes, I actually wanna turn the floor now to our incredible panel and to Jay Booksbaum, who is going to kick us off and give us more of a background on each of our um, panelists and wineries. So thank you again. And we're going to... One second. Sorry. Okay, now, now, now. We can hear you. We're gonna spotlight you also. And sorry, before we get started, one more thing, just a housekeeping note. Um, I wanted to ask, everybody stays on mute except for our speakers. And if you have any questions or any comments that you wanna make, please put them in the chat and we will be taking questions from the chat. And we of course also wanna give a big shout out to Lawrence Askowitz who is on the call, who was very helpful in getting this program off the ground. So thank you, Lawrence. And now I will officially turn it over to Jay, whose name is appearing as Brenda, but that is not who he is. He is Jay. So thank you, Jay. <laughs> hey, and hey not, yeah. not that there's anything wrong with that, you know, right? <laughs> not at all. I hear you. I hear you. Um, um, I'm getting, I'm getting a, little a little echo. echo. We hear you. Okay. Jesus. Jay, are you on your phone in the computer? computer? I'm just, I'm just on the computer. computer. Hold on, hold on. Yeah, turn, turn the phone off. Phone off. Zoom, zoom, zoom. Double, zoom. double zoom. Science, science fiction. We may be nine months in, but we're still having Zoom technicalities. So we'll just get ourselves situated one more minute. You should mute Jay in the meantime. Yes, we were going to do that. We just saw him rejoin again. It should be all sorted out now. Thank you. Of course. I'd appreciate Jay's artwork. Please. Okay, is that working now? Yes, you sound great. Yeah. Okay. Okay, first of all, before we get started, um, we're going to use the first wine that we're going to do it with, but you told everybody to open their wines. I want to teach somebody something that I learned at a really good restaurant, in fact, in Tel Aviv. And that, that is that this wine is a screw cap. So of course, like think people think it's uncool because it's not a cork, right? It's not a cork wine. But I learned something in a restaurant in Tel Aviv. First of all, it is cool. You know, the, the um, trend is to go to wines that are to be drunk young to go to a screw cap. In fact, in New Zealand, a law is that all Sauvignon Blanc, maybe all wines soon, will have to be only in a screw cap, okay? But here's the thing, instead of keeping and holding the cap, just hold below the cap. Can everybody see me? Okay, and turn the bottle. And I saw this done at a restaurant in Tel Aviv and I thought, Gee, that, that's really cool. So instead of having that pop that you usually get that you miss with a screw cap, you can open the wine like that. And so uh, we'll just 
do that just for fun. And it's quite a nice wine. Um, okay, so real quick, I'm gonna give a very short uh, intro and I'm gonna do all three wineries at once. Okay, and then I'll you know turn it over to the different wineries. I think uh, Ronnie and um, correct me if I'm wrong. We're going with a uh, Tabor, then you, then Jezreel, or the opposite. I think definitely start with the white. You yeah, and then whatever you want. Okay, okay. And Nick, Jacob, we we're doing the Alpha. Yes, we are. And we're doing the regular Alpha. Regular Alpha, yes. Okay, great. So then what we're going to do is we're going to end, then we're going to do you next, Jacob, and we're going to do Michal first, okay? So sure. just a real quick on each of the wineries, you know, we have something in the marketing business we call a USP, which means a unique selling proposition. But I, I'd like to think it of a unique character in a, in a human being, or for that matter, in a winery. So in the case of Tabor, the unique character, they have several, but the, the most unique character is the fact that they were the first winery and perhaps to this day, the only winery that has a full-time agronomist. And what's interesting about that story, about that is that agronomist is somebody who really understands and is an expert on the ground, okay, on the vineyards. And, you know, you, you have full-time winemakers and sometimes you have full-time lab people and sometimes you have full-time this or full-time that, but it's rare for a winery to start out understanding that the most important thing is the vineyards. And I'll just tell you a real quick story. When I was a much younger man, I used to sell a non-kosher wine called Litton Springs, which was hailed by the New York Times while I was selling it, thank God, as the quintessential Zinfandel. And I asked the owner of Lytton Springs, the winemaker owner of Lytton Springs, I asked him, what makes great wine? And he said, there's only three things that matter. Good grapes, that's the number one thing. Anybody can tell me what the second thing is? Good grapes. Good, gra good grapes. And anybody can tell me what the third thing is? Good, good grapes. grapes. Exactly right. So without further ado, that's what um, Tabor is all about. Of course, they started out as vineyard growers, and then they were they got into winemaking, and now they're part of a much bigger company, but not a much, but they haven't swelled their heads. So that's the great part about Michal and the people at Tabor. Uh, as, as in terms of Jezreel, one of only three wineries in the entire country, and they were, I think, the second one to do this, that is focused on all the other wineries from the Golan Heights all the way down to the Negev are focused on what we call Vitis vinifera which is, you know, Cabernet, Chardonnay, Merlot, Sauvignon Blanc, uh, Gewurztraminer. I think there are, a, you know, it, it grew since I was a kid, young in this business, but it used to be, we used to call them the seven great Vitis vinifera. Now there are like, I don't know, there's, you know, now they've included a lot more in it, but very few, if any, until just a few years ago, and Jezreel was the pioneer in that, one of the pioneers in that, decided that they're gonna make wines only from Israeli Mediterranean grapes. And that's what they're doing. And so the distinct character and quality of the, uh, the terroir, which is the combination of the place that it comes from in the air and the soil, et cetera, is combined with the specific specificity of the grapes that are grown in that part of the world. And just a, on a personal note, both Jacob and Yehuda, who's the winemaker, are also just magnificent people with amazing passion for what they do. And finally, going to my good friend Ronnie and the people at, uh, the people at uh, and I'm gonna date myself here by telling you a little bit of a story, a, back, a historical story. Everybody thinks that Israel was put on the map in the late, in the early eighties when somebody from uh, UC Davis was asked to tell them what they should grow in the Golan Heights after it was, it was, uh, you know, it was taken over. And um, they thought they were going to grow citrus. And of course, he told them to grow, you know, wine, and they did. And, but it's not true. The real first time that the world discovered uh, great wines from Israel was in 1976. 
1976, then Yisrael Flam, one of the winemakers at Carmel, made the 76 Reserve Cabernet, which was hailed by all kinds of critics all over the world as Israel has arrived. We think that happened in the 1980s with the Golan Heights. No, it was way before that in the late 1980s. It was way before that in 76. And I, in fact, sold it in the, in the early 80s. And it was in the non-kosher best restaurants in New York, Les Long, for example, and others. The other wine that was also made famous by them was their Sauvignon Blanc, their, their um, Reserve Sauvignon Blanc. In, on top of that, Carmel was also founded by the Rothschild family and uh, with the, you know, in conjunction with the growers, they weren't winemakers, they were growers. So much, much like Michal is focused on the land, that's what they originated from. And what's wonderful about Carmel, I just had a talk with Ronnie about this today, is that they have everything from the limited, which is an amazing bottle of ridiculously wonderful red wine to selected and even below that, but selected, which is also excellent wine. And so you have everything in between. And so those are the three wineries. And from that, I will hand it off to Michal, who is, I can't believe is up at three o'clock in the morning, by the way, guys. So three o'clock in the morning. So here's to you, Michal. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jay. Thank you. Great words about the Israeli industry. Um... And, and thank you for, for everyone to join us to, today, tonight, this evening, this night, I don't know. <laughs> um, so you're drinking the Mount of War Chardonnay. I, I hope you, as uh, Alisa said before, I hope you chill it before, uh, and I hope you're drinking it uh, very cold. Um, this wine, it's kind of a fruit forward wine with a very great acid to, to balance it. You can smell it, you can feel it. Uh, this wine was fermented in stale and steel uh, with no malolactic fermentation, uh, just to keep it fresh and aromatic. Um, yeah, it's still fresh and aromatic. Um, as Jay said before, uh, Tavo Winery uh, is located in Kfar Tavor, the foothills of the famous Mount Tavor in Israel, in the Galilee. Um, the village of Kfar Tavor is, uh, was established by the Rothschild family uh, from uh, the Chateau uh, Lafitte, if you, if, you, if you know them. And as, as Jay said before, we believe in grapes, we believe in soil, we believe in terroir, and that's why all of our vineyards uh, are located in all the high altitude uh, growing region uh, in Israel, from Mitzperamon in the south to Jerusalem hills and the central hills in uh, the central mountains in, in Israel, to the Golan Heights and Upper Galilee. All the Chardonnay vineyards actually is around Kfar Tavor village, the winery, uh, just in Kfar Tavor. Uh, so we want to control this grape. So we be believe to, to uh, uh, put them very close to the winery. That's why the distance from the harvest time, the harvest time is much shorter because the distance is really short. Um, we focused on soil. We have a lot of different uh, soil style, like volcanic and limestone, terra rossa, and lost in uh, in the desert at the Negev. Um, each soil type has a different characteristic, which greatly influence how we grow and manage uh, the a particular vineyard. Um, what else can we say about this? Like. As Jay, Jay said, everything, 90% from the wine quality belongs to the grapes. We believe in grapes, uh, and Israel is a hot climate country, so we spread risk. We put in all high altitude uh, just to bring the vine our vineyards to be in cool climate uh, as much as we can. Um, and I hope you enjoy, enjoy this wine. I, I think it's a lovely, great wine. Michal. Yeah. If I may, could you talk a little bit about what you've done with the, you know, with the environment with and the, the animal? Yeah. yeah. So 
Yes, you're right. Like eight years ago, we started uh, a great project with the, in the beginning with the Society of the Pre Preservation of Nature uh, about sustainability. We wanted to do some uh, um, uh, revolution in our vineyards and to bring all of our vineyards to be uh, under the sustainability rules. Uh, we believe in sustainability. It's all about maintaining an ecological balance between nature, nature and the vineyards. So we joined them. We started to work on all of our vineyards all over the country because you know vineyards like other crops are a part of an ecosystem and you should give and receive from the ecosystem and we started to believe in this and all of our vineyards became uh, we increase biodiversity uh, we bring all the nature to come back to the vineyards and not to bring the not to give the vineyards to be uh, like a monoculture we believe that all the nature should be with the vineyards, growing with the vineyards, and then we will receive the balanced ecosystem to provide to provide the uh, provides for us the chicks and balance that regulate itself to protect against outbreaks and all kinds of drought and everything. So uh, we started a revolution eight years ago, and after three years, we find out that the vineyards react great to this revolution. All, a lot of animals came back. So we increased biodiversity. Our vineyards looks like a, a, a home of, from, for the nature and not just for agriculture. And uh, we waited until the, the barn owl will, will uh, come back to our vineyards because this uh, uh, bird is uh, the symbol of the, the most ecological hunter in in the in the nature and uh, by 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 bringing back the the barn all we just close in uh, the cycle of life that we started three years ago and after three years we we build a lot of nesting box all, all over the vineyards and then we saw the barn all is coming back to us and then we decided to change all of our labels in uh, Tavor uh, and to give this the, the first lady, this barn all to be all, all over our bottles, uh, just to, uh, it's a kind of a stamp of ecological sustainable vineyards. Uh, the, the, all the, the goal of this project was to create an ecological balance between vineyards and the nature. Um, in order to support integrated ecosystem and to increase the wine quality, which we see in th those days, uh, these days, sorry. Um, that's that's in, in, in a very few words. We're gonna, I'm gonna be um, repeating questions from everybody who's listening, but the first question that it's really pertains to you specifically is, the question is from Mr. Lawrence. Um, his name is... Uh, yeah, La I'm sorry, Lawrence Askowitz. The question is, um, do different grapes like different soils? For example, does Cabernet like one kind of soil while Chardonnay likes another? Could you explain that very briefly? Because we want to move to the next. Um, yes, as I said before, every every soil type there, uh, got a different characteristic. And if you put uh, Chardonnay, for example, you don't need to go to different varieties. If you put Chardonnay on these four different soil, like uh, volcanic, terra rossa, limestone, and, and uh, loss, you will get a different different characteristic in the wine style, uh, which is bring much more uh, uh, diverse wine. And then you can play with this at the winery, which is great. Uh, because I don't have a lot of time, I'm not going to get into it, but there is a lot of influence to every soil type in, in the wine style and what you get in the aroma and the flavors and everything. Thank you. Okay, uh, without further ado, let's hear Jacob tell us about Jezreel. And while he's doing it, I want to show you how to open up a bottle of wine. This is, a, this is my favorite corkscrew. It's a, it's a waiter's corkscrew. I put the, the I put the, what do you, the, uh, uh, the knife under the second lip, 
I just turn the bottle in my fist and look how beautifully that comes off. And then go ahead, Jacob. Yeah, we're gonna pour at the same time. Uh, but actually what Jay is doing is, is important because uh, uh, Elisa said earlier that she hoped people decanted their uh, red wine and chilled their white wine. And specifically uh, this wine, but we actually try this with, with many of our wines is um, you shouldn't need to decant it. Uh, sometimes it can get much better uh, with decanting and we can talk about what decanting is. But uh, the idea of uh, Alpha, um, this is a wine which we first released uh, in the 2017 vintage and you're now drinking the 2019 vintage. Um, I'm very proud that the 2017 vintage right out the gate was rated 90 by uh, wine enthusiasts. Uh, got a lot of good marks from other, other folks as well. And uh, I think it's only gotten better over the uh, next, two, next two vintages. Uh, mine is the, uh, the, the Hebraic version, but it's the same wine. <laughs> and the reason why I said you don't have to do, can't, decant it, uh, the, uh, yeah, we do English as well. We're bilingual. So um, we, uh, we introduced the Alpha as a young wine. Most of our uh, blends are actually barrel aged for uh, 18 to 22 months uh, before we bottle and release them. The Alpha uh, blend, and I'll get into the varietals in a second, uh, the Alpha blend is uh, barrel aged for about 10 months. Um, uh, then we blend and then uh, we release after about 12 months, uh, bottle it after about 12 months. Uh, which is why uh, we can get it out to the market earlier, which is why you're already drinking 2019. Um, and the reason that we came out with the younger uh, wine uh, was twofold. One, we wanted to play with the varietals that Jay mentioned that we focus on and see uh, what happens um, if we, uh, when we first started out, uh, we, were, we were kind of going all in, uh, both in terms of how much we were aging our wines and the varietals we were using. And we started to play and say, you know, how does this taste as a younger wine? So what you have uh, in front of you, and we're, we're, we're gonna do a l'chaim over, um, is uh, uh, basically Syrah and Argaman. So Syrah you're familiar with. Um, I, I assume many of you are familiar with Syrah. Uh, we have Syrah in almost all of our blends. And Argaman, I'll spend just a, a, a focus on, so when we started out, we wanted to uh, both highlight uh, great varieties or varietals that are indicative of a Mediterranean climate, which we are in, uh, but we also um, wanted to place a focus on a grape, which was actually created uh, here in Israel, which very much uh, speaks to us as, as people, where we celebrate both our history and our modernity. So our, the Argaman grape was created by the Israeli uh, research arm of the Israeli Ministry of Agriculture um, in the late 70s and introduced and planted in the early 80s. And in itself is a synthesis of um, Carignan, which is very widely planted in Israel, uh, thanks to Baron Rothschild, uh, amongst other people, but mainly Baron Rothschild, um, and uh, Suzo, uh, the Portuguese varietal. And it was an attempt, uh, after hundreds of attempts, to create a varietal which would do really well uh, in modern Israel with everything that that means. So uh, when Argaman first came out, the winemakers in Israel then in the 80s didn't really know how to handle it too well. And over time it became used sort of as a, 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 filler, um, a filler wine and to give one way to give color to other wines because it is a beautiful, gorgeous, deep coloring I uh, urge you to go check it out, uh, Argaman on its own. Um, and we do make a single varietal Argaman. Uh, we said, we're gonna really take Argaman and it's, we're gonna put it in everything. We're gonna make a single uh, varietal Argaman um, and people are gonna hear about Argaman. Um, and it, it, was a, it was a real uphill battle for the first couple of years. Now I'm very happy to say that Argaman is fully accepted as a, uh, as a, as a varietal uh, here, here in Israel as it should be. Um, so. Uh, first of all, I'm just going to take a sip of this myself because it is time to drink some wine. So l'chaim and Hanukkah Sameach to everyone. Um, the other element that I want to talk uh, for a second about is also uh, food pairing, which is a big part of kind of what we do. Yehuda Nahar, um, who is my co-founder and uh, winemaker, 
is also a foodie. Um, and I eat food, but <laughs> he's more of a foodie and he's actually a food writer, Ynet, one of the uh, uh, leading uh, um, newspapers here. And the big question is, you know, with Mediterranean uh, style wines, what do you what do you eat it with? Well, luckily enough, we also have Mediterranean style food uh, in Israel, and most of our food is Mediterranean style food. So, if you're looking in terms of wine pairings and specifically uh, Jezreel Valley winery wines, I would say we do best when pairing uh, our wines with Mediterranean uh, cuisine, uh, which is why Israeli chefs who have branched out all over the world, really love our wines and similar wines coming out of Israel because they do really well uh, with, with the food that they're serving. So, you know, one of, the, one of the fun events that we did once, and then I'll turn it back over to, to Jay, is we invited uh, a number of years ago, we invited all the top wine critics here uh, in Israel, um, which means about 8 million people, because everybody in Israel, you know, is a critic. Uh, whether they know anything about wine or not. We invited a whole bunch of the top wine reviewers to uh, a very well-known restaurant um, in Tel Aviv. And um, they were expecting this kind of elaborate uh, chef dinner to go with the wine, uh, vertical wine uh, uh, um, tasting we were doing specifically of Argaman. And instead we served them shawarma. Um, and they were taken aback at like, what, you're giving us street food to, to have with our wine? And they all agreed at the end of the evening, it was incredible uh, because it just goes uh, so well together. Um, so I uh, urge you to uh, try out Jezreel Alpha together with uh, Mediterranean cuisine, but it also goes well with everything else. So thank you. Got a, got a question from somebody on, on the chat here that's specifically perfect for you, Jacob. And that is, is because this is the only blend that we're having tonight. And the question is, when does the blending take place? Is it early on or is it right before bottling? Right, so conceptually the, the, the blending is taking place early on. When I say conceptually, because we are tasting every barrel um, for wine that's being aged uh, in barrel, then you're tasting every barrel for wine that's being uh, uh, aged in tanks. So then it's taking place you know, out of the, the, the tanks, but um, we're tasting them on a, a regular basis because every, um, kind of receptacle of wine is a living organism. And, and that goes straight through to, to the bottle. Even every single bottle of wine will, will kind of con continue to live uh, and, and develop. Um, but in terms of the, uh, specifically for us, we already kind of start to say, ah, these barrels are gonna go with these barrels, these barrels are gonna go uh, with those. Um, for example, the best, uh, what we think are the best barrels of every vintage we put aside and that becomes our icon wine. Um, so conceptually, it's happening already uh, right from the beginning, right after, after we uh, uh, start to check the barrel. The actual uh, blending by us, for example, for Jezreel, will, um, will take place uh, uh, a couple of weeks or, or about a month uh, before we bottle. Great, great. Um, OK, we're going we're gonna to go to um, Ronnie. But I have to tell you a story, and it you, you actually, Jacob, reminded me of this story. It's kind of a famous I don't know, joke or story about Israel, and that is, is that you, you said that everybody's a critic in Israel, right? You got 8 million critics. So Ben-Gurion actually worked at the Carmel Winery, right? And the story goes that Ben-Gurion, when he met the president of the United States, the president said, oh, you don't know how many people I have to... I have to lead, it's like 100 million people in those days, right? 120 million people. And Ben-Gurion turned to him and said, yeah, you have to lead 100 million people, but I have 100, I have 4 million presidents that I have, you know, that I have to lead. So, you know, everybody's a critic, everybody's a president, right? Anyway, without further ado, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Ronnie. Ronnie, it's all yours. L'chaim everyone, happy Hanukkah. Thank you, Jay, Brenda. Uh, thank you, Eliza, for putting this together. It's a real honor. And to my fellow Israelis out there who are up at 3 a.m., L'chaim to you guys, happy Hanukkah. Really enjoyed hearing what you had to say. I think it's important. I've done so many Zooms, and I know a lot of us have done Zooms, but 
Zooms are so much better when you have wine. So again, L'chaim guys. Um, I also want to just tell you what's nice and to echo what Jay was saying about all the presidents in, the, in, in, in Israel. Um, while I'm in America, I consider myself very Israeli. I fought in the IDF or served in the IDF. And um, I hope you guys can hear me. I don't know if I... We can hear you yeah, fine. Okay, cool. My, my screen uh, froze, so I'm just going to go. Um, I served in the IDF, and um, it's the thing I'm most proud of. And then the thing that I'm doing today is working in the Israeli wine industry. So I see it as a direct connection. Not to talk too political, but there are many um, organizations and efforts that want to discredit Israel and hurt it financially and say boycott Israel. And I'm part of the other group that's saying buy Israeli goods. So I want to just start by saying if you're not going to buy Carmel, which I hope you will, buy some Jezreel, buy some Tabor, buy Israeli wine, give people Israeli wine, non-Jews, Jews, this is that perfect time of year, um, get people Israeli wine. In my own home, I have Jezreel wine, Tabor wine, I drink your guys Sauvignon Blanc all the time. I really recommend, we're, we're doing the Chardonnay tonight, but um, Tabor Sauvignon Blanc is fantastic. And um, I'm proud of Israel. And on that note, a lot of it comes from Carmel. A lot of the story of not only the Israeli wine story, but Carmel was the first Israeli company. We're talking about Ben-Gurion. I mean, it predates the state of Israel. We have so many bottles of wine that say on it, Palestine wine. And, you know, from the days of the Ottoman Empire, even before the British were there. And what we're most proud of is how we deliver quality. And Jay was saying this at every level. What we're drinking today is Cabernet Sauvignon, which is the most popular grape. It's the most popular grape grown. It's the most popular grape drunken drink. And uh, it's our number one, two, three, and four bestseller. Um, this specific Cabernet Sauvignon, I think, has the best value. And that's because it's an everyday Cabernet Sauvignon, but it's made just like you would make a high-end Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, obviously, and I'm going to go very basic here, Cabernet Sauvignon is the name of the grape. And we talked about grapes and how they grow in different soil types or in different regions differently. And think of pizza. Every pizza you eat all has bread. It's bread, tomato sauce, and cheese, but it always tastes different. Similar wine. It's grapes. And even if you use Cabernet Sauvignon or even if you use Cabernet Sauvignon from the same country like Israel, it's always going to taste different. And that's one of the most beautiful features of wine because the word terroir, this French word, doesn't just mean ground and earth and it means place and time. It's this beautiful, almost Jewish word. It's that time of year mixed with that land. And um, this Cabernet Sauvignon, we're going for consistency and Cabernet Sauvignon as a grape thrives in almost any region. It really is one of the, think of grapes, not just as a plant, like a, think of it almost like a tomato plant, how when you let it grow wild, it's, it's gonna be this weed. You know, they're, 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 they have these natural qualities and Cabernet Sauvignon really thrives and it's fruity. That's why people always love it. And I'm gonna, I wanna open up the floor to questions because I think that's really fun. But I wanna also tell a funny story that when I, go to stores in Brooklyn, they'll say, give me Carbonet, you know, with their thick Yiddish accent. And I've, I've learned to correct them and say, you mean, here's your Cabernet, sir. And then they correct me and I say, this is Williamsburg, it's Carbonet here. So <laughs> it doesn't matter really what's in your glass. What matters is enjoy it. It's part of our tradition. Uh, us Jews, we didn't just learn about wine in the past five years because kosher wine got better. We've been saying L'chaim forever. We've been saying Borei Priya Guffin forever, whether it's a bris, whether it's a wedding or every single Shabbos. Um, in times like COVID, enhance any meal with a glass of wine, a steak dinner, a shawarma dinner, 
drink more. And I'm just gonna give two pointers. Smell wine, learn to smell it. Always smell your wine. Us Jews are gifted. We, we were gifted with beautiful noses and these wine glasses were made big so you can smell it and drink at the same time. Drink and smell, drink and smell, taste and drink. I feel like I'm on Sesame Street here, the way I'm talking, but <laughs> what I'm getting at is be comfortable with smelling and also try to hit the back of your tongue. Um, I was just having a, a Zoom with a great um, influencer, Jay Cohen, and he was talking about how the tongue has different receptors all over, and it's not just different spots that can taste different bitter or sweet in different spots, but it's just the concentration of those taste buds. And I'm by no means an expert on this or a scientist, but the back of your tongue will always be friendlier to bitter and dry wines. So on that note, smell, hit the back of your tongue and drink wine with food. L'chaim, let's open up the floor to some questions, guys. Okay, um, let me just, uh, first of all, I wanna give a shout out to uh, Ron Nagel, a relative of mine li joining us all the way from California. So just a shout out. But uh, you know, you, you make a really good point about the carbonate, but it doesn't matter what you call it. They tell a very famous story about Baron uh, Philip, Philip Rothschild who founded the entire wine business in France, forget about Israel. Our entire wine business in France was founded by him. And they once asked him, what, what you remember your, fav your most favorite wine of all time? The wine that you like most of all time. He said, he turned to them and he said, you know, I don't really remember the wine, but I certainly remember the pretty lady and the tree that we drank it under. And uh, that's the point I think that Ronnie was making that, you know, it doesn't matter whether you call it Cabernet correctly or carb carbonate incorrectly, you know, the point is enjoy it and especially enjoy it with friends. Um, and one other point, you know, we, we had at Kedem, I'm with Royal and I bring in all these wines and we had this big national sales meeting for the first time about 20 years ago. And everybody from each division said what they had to say about selling and finance and shipping and production. And then came the guy who was the, you know, total manager, Mr. Herzog himself. And he said, and he was supposed to talk about the overall management. And he said, guys, remember, we are not in the wine business. And everybody looked at him curiously. What do you mean you're not in the wine business? Yep, we're not in the wine business. We're in the bar mitzvah business. We're in the Friday night dinner business. We're in the bris business. We're in the wedding business. We're in the celebration of a milestone business. That's the business we're in. And if you can enjoy your wine with that in mind, uh, it'll be much more enjoyable. <laughs> so I'm looking at some of the questions. Okay. Are there tours to visit? Uh, I'm gonna throw this, actually I'm gonna throw this to you, Ronnie. Are there tours that specifically are, to go to Israel and specifically are focused on wine? Of course, we're talking about after COVID. Yes, there are a lot of, when I say a lot, there are some experts who will go to different wineries. Um, bottom line, the beauty of Israel is it's such a small country. You can design this yourself. All of the wineries will not only roll out the royal carpet for you, but will literally are designed to have tasting rooms and, and, and want you to visit it because we know that when you come to the winery and you have that connection with the winery, you will always enjoy the wine in your home better when you go back. And that's what wine does. It, it allows you to transport yourself. Right now in your glass, you're tasting Israel. And that's what I was trying to tell you guys by buying this gift for people. Tell them taste Israel. Whether you're in a hotel, tell them, why don't you have Israeli wine? Or if you're in a you know wine shop, tell them get some Israeli wine. But if you're talking to a friend, let them taste Israel that way. Okay, um, someone asked, tell us about decanting and aerating. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna take this one myself. Um, I don't like gadgets and wine. I don't like the air pump. I don't like the gas things. I don't like any of those things. 
but I, there's one gadget I love, and that's this. The cheapest, simplest aerator that just simply goes right into the thing and you pour it into your glass and it goes glug, 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 and it really does make a difference. Otherwise, especially with reds, and not so much with whites, but especially with reds, but it helps whites too. Um, you really have to decant it for a while and, and aromas do come out. And sometimes, you know, people say, will wine be good the next day? Cause Friday night, I can't finish it. Very often a good red wine will be not good the next day, will be better, much better. And I've experienced that over and over and over again. So there you go on that. So on the wine tourism front, I just want to add in and, uh, what Ronnie was saying in terms of how small uh, the country is. It's also a country of microclimates. Um, and I urge you to get out and actually experience the vineyards themselves. I've actually been in the Tavor vineyards a number of times. And there are, no, there are new vineyards being planted all the time uh, throughout Israel from the desert. Uh, you can go down uh, and see uh, excellent vineyards um, uh, being uh, grown in, in the desert uh, conditions, uh, all the way up to, to the Golan Heights, obviously, um, but literally everywhere in Israel. So if you open up your eyes, and one of the things that a, a good, uh, and certainly a great wine tour guide, and there are more and more of them all the time now, uh, sadly, because of COVID, a lot of them are kind of struggling. So I hope you all come back and do book a wine tour guide and go visit wineries with them. But the good ones will also take you to the vineyard. And if you come to Israel during harvest season, which is, let's say, from the beginning, of, uh, uh, of uh, Elul from the beginning of sort of August through Sukkot, uh, you can find harvest going on. And somebody asked about woofing. Um, it's a little bit more complicated in Israel, but you can find it. Um, and you can contact me for, for more and I can refer to some wineries that do do that. But you can definitely volunteer to uh, just take, take, take part in the harvest. And it's an incredible experience. Almost every winery will welcome you to place uh, to take part uh, in a harvest, and you can just volunteer and go out and spend half an hour or a few hours, and it's an unforgettable experience. Question was from let's see, question was from um, Yaakov Talbis. Yaakov Talbis wants to talk briefly because we could do a whole three weeks on this briefly, and I'm going to give this to you, Jacob. Uh, briefly talk about Mavusha. <laughs> you had to give me that one. Yep. So, um, um, so I, I'm not going to get into the, the, the history of Mavusha and everything, but for, for those of you who are aware, and since this is a YU event, I assume there's some awareness of uh, Mavusha. Um, so I'll skip over some of the halachic issues. Um, and we know when we uh, first started, we said we weren't going to do any Mavushal uh, wines. We very kind of had our uh, both taste and our ideological noses in the air. And uh, it was Jay Buxbaum that uh, taught us otherwise uh, on, on all levels um, and actually kind of gave us a whole range of wines um, that were Mavushal wines to taste. And, and we were blown away. And, and we decided we were going to take it uh, quite seriously uh, for those people that uh, Mevushal is important to them. And Jezreel Alpha 2017 was the first Mevushal wine we made. But we said, when I said we take it seriously, part of you know what we said is we're going to combine the halachic issues and modern technology. In, 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 in this has been going on for 20 years or more, 30, 30 years. Um, we just kind of are part of that trend. Um, which, whether it be, was, was Hagafen in, in California or many wineries in, in, in Israel, um, which also is taking flash pasteurization, which you could all kind of Google and research on your own, and, and in parallel with the halachic requirements of, of Mevushal. And we were lucky enough that um, we have neighbors next to the, the winery that actually, oh, this is not only an Israel story. This could not happen in Napa, I don't think, um, or certainly not in Tuscany. Uh, where our neighbors, who are next to the winery, um, uh, uh, are a uh, R and D center for the heating and cooling of missile systems, um, and they also love our wine. And we said to them a whole bunch of years ago, we need to create our own uh, system, for bringing wine up very high, very quickly, and then bringing it back down very quickly 
without uh, damaging the uh, quality of wine, and in fact, you know, only, only making it better um, in the end. And, and that's what we did, and we designed our own system for uh, creating, or for uh, meeting the Bouchelle standards, um, approved by many uh, various rabbinical authorities. Um, so I'm very kind of proud that we kind of not only did Mavushal, but, but took it seriously, both on a technology level and on a taste level. Um, and then the last thing I can say is, you know, a lot of people have an ideological issue uh, with Mavushal. Um, there was one particular Israeli chef who I will not name by name, because not nice, um, but this Israeli chef uh, said to me, who has restaurants outside of Israel, said to me, I'll try your wines, but I will never ever serve a Mavushal wine in one of my restaurants. And I said, oh, you know, that's okay, whatever. Let's just drink wine together. And I poured the uh, Jezreel Alpha 2017. Um, didn't say anything. And it, it actually says on the back of it, uh, Mev. And um, the Israeli chef tasted the wine and said, see, this is a great wine. This wine I will serve in my restaurant day in, day out. This is a great wine for, <laughs> for, for what I'm doing. Uh, to this day, I have not told them it's Mevushal. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. Can, I just, can we just sorry there's two questions one is in case anybody doesn't know what mibushal is can you give a one word on what that actually means i'll do that i'll do that okay thank you that. Um, thank you it's it's a long discussion but mibushal means flash pasteurized flash pasteurized and that because of halachic reasons which are too long to go over tonight allows the wine to retain its kashras integrity even when poured by a non-Jewish, non-observant, even non-Jewish or non-observant Jew in a public setting. So Mabushal is important because if you want to pour it in a restaurant and you have non-Jewish or non-Sabbath observant pours, or you want to serve it at a wedding under similar circumstances that I just described, you have to have a Mabushal wine. And real quick, uh, this is for you, Ronnie. Ronnie, if someone yeah. asked, I think it was, um, what was her name? Um, Melissa wants to know what does private collection mean? Private collection is a pretty way of saying it's a good bottle. It's a uh, branding. It's ironic because we've been doing the private collection series for, I don't even know, 30, 40 years. But what's cute about it, and I want to I wanna say go for the Shiraz. We're drinking the Cab now, but I want to encourage you guys to go for Shiraz because Jacob was talking about Syrah, Syrah, Shiraz, basically same grape, but uh, I think that grape grows so well in Israel. So talking about Shiraz, I, I, I wanna encourage you to go there. And I wanna say that private collection, again, it's, it, it just, it used to be a more expensive bottle, but what we're, what we're doing here is we're over delivering for an everyday bottle. And I think more importantly, I saw my buddy Rafi Glickman ask a question about do blends or do single grapes age better? Now, all three of the wines we're drinking tonight are not for aging. They're generally for everyday use. The whole world of aging wines, that's when you get really geeky and really fun and really cool. But it's important to have a good storage system and to store the right bottles. I would not recommend storing any of these bottles we don't really store white. There are some exceptions, but white, besides dessert wines and a few other exceptions like a Riesling, they're not supposed to be stored. But with storing as far as what do better blends or single grapes, blends historically are better at, at aging and the most famous aged bottles are generally the blended bottles. Um, so I hope I answered that. Good to see you, Rafi. And, um, Couple of people, couple of people, I'm gonna turn this to Michal if she knows, cause I don't. And I thought I knew a lot about wine, but a couple, couple of people and, and apparently Jacob does, but I'm not gonna let you get away with it so easy. But what is woofing? I have no idea what that means. And a well, lot of people don't know what it means. I don't know. What does, what does woofing mean? Jacob? Um, so woofing is part of um, kind of a, a, a movement um, around the world of essentially vo volunteering on in the agricultural settings. Um, usually you kind of volunteer your, your time and you get 
either a place to stay for free or even full room and board, um, kind of a global, global room. And a lot of uh, Israelis post army will take advantage of, of woofing around the, around the world. Um, but you don't have to be 22. You could be 62 or 82 uh, to do it as well. Um, anyway, that's uh, more or less what, what woofing is. But somebody put a link in to one of the woofing sites where you can learn more about it. Okay, I think we're good. Um, I really want to, I'm going to turn it back to, what? Just quickly, before, before uh, another thing I want to plug is there's a wonderful organization in Israel called Hashomer Hadash that put out a, um, which tries to reconnect people to the land and to agriculture. Um, and one of the things they did is they developed an app, which I don't know if it's in English, but uh, anybody who writes me, I'll, I'll send you the link to download the app. The app is called Sundu. And it has um, volunteering opportunities in agriculture uh, around the year at all times. But during harvest, a lot of wineries in Israel are connected to uh, Sundu, and you can volunteer in, in a harvest through uh, Sundu. Um, so definitely check it out. Um, it's like our local version of Woofing, and you'll definitely get a few free grapes out of it. Also, Jay, I think woofing is what my dog does. And I think that's <laughs> where I think, I believe that's where the term comes from uh, this is this has been a wonderful time Aliza it's all yours thank you so much that was a lot of fun I really appreciate um, certainly all the informative uh, aspects of wine tasting and drinking so thank you so much and this was certainly um, just a, a really Great way to bring, like we said, all of us together. And I want to also give a quick thank you to Isaac Schechter of uh, kosherwines.com who helped us out with getting everybody their wines. And if anybody wants to buy more wines, we encourage you to visit their sites. I'm sure you can also buy directly from all of our wineries who are represented here, who I believe also all have representatives here in America selling their wines. Um, and of course, I also want to give, uh, thank everybody rather, who um, is on this call, who has given philanthropically to YU up at so far. And for those of you who would like to continue to support us, certainly before the end of the year, you can visit yu.edu slash give. And of course, again, I wanna thank Jacob, Michal, Rani, and Jay for pinch hitting again, for joining us tonight. It was fabulous. And to all of you who joined us tonight, we really could um, not have expected a better crowd. So thank you so much. And for those of you who want to woof. Maybe you'll woof somewhere together. I don't know if that's a thing now, but I think we all learned certainly a new word in addition to new wine. So like everyone said, l'chaim, happy Hanukkah, and thank you again so much for joining us. Have a great night, everybody. Laila tov, Hanukkah sameach.